By now, you've probably heard about this magical, mystical word, Web3. But if you still find yourself sitting at home on your laptop thinking like, what the heck is this thing? Don't worry, you're not alone. So in this video, we're going to explain exactly what Web3 is. But a quick disclaimer, it's important to note that Web3, it's still in its infancy. It's rapidly evolving and it's gonna continue to evolve for quite some time. It's like a little, little child, a little baby that we're all trying to nurture and grow up into something awesome for us to use in the future. So make sure to stick around to the end of the video so you can learn exactly what Web3 is and how you can implement it in your life. And click the subscribe button while you're at it. All right, to break down exactly what Web3 is, it actually helps to take a trip down memory lane. Discussing the history of the internet makes where we're going in Web3 a lot clearer. So, so far, there have been two previous iterations of the internet, Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. Web 1.0 was the dinosaur age of the internet, spanning from the mid-1980s to the early 2000s. It was born out of the work that began in 1973 when the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, aka DARPA, started research on protocols allowing computers to communicate over distributed networks. Thank God that did that, I love the internet. During Web 1.0, the internet primarily consisted of a series of pages joined together by hyperlinks without any additional visuals or comment sections. Internet users were nothing more than passive recipients of the information. You could say that this was the read-only era of the internet. Then comes Web 2.0 where we've been living for the past 20 years. The average individual, aka me and you, isn't a passive observer anymore. Instead, they play an active role in creating and sharing and publishing content on the internet, like TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and blogs, even comment sections, like we're participating, we're helping the thing go. Think of every time you've pressed the like button on Instagram or dropped a mean review on Yelp about a restaurant you hated. Now, Web 2.0 is amazing, but unfortunately, intermediaries came along with it. So to find a cool company or a brand, you rely on Google. To find that artist that you love that your friend told you about, you rely on Instagram or Spotify. To order that desk or that trash can you need for your apartment, you rely on Amazon. Are you seeing a trend? So platforms like Google and Spotify, Amazon, Facebook, and all the other big names in Web 2.0 they serve as centralized data aggregators. They are intermediaries between suppliers and consumers, capturing nearly all the value in the form of data and money. It's ridiculous, really. So these platforms, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, primarily create value by enabling direct interactions between groups. And they now dominate the global economy as some of the world's most profitable companies. But eventually, it becomes profitable for these platforms to make it increasingly difficult for groups to interact directly with one another. These intermediaries became more of a roadblock than a throughfare. So if you're concerned with your data privacy, and you actually are afraid of the immense power that comes with such centralization, or you're trying to build a business on the back of a TikTok platform or Instagram platform or a YouTube platform or a commerce marketplace. Web 2.0 can actually be deeply troubling because you could spend all this time and effort building this thing and it could just disappear. So let's enter into Web 3 and blockchain. So Web 3 is the next generation of the internet. It's focused on shifting the power away from big tech like Facebook and Google and toward the individual user like you and me. It's actually centered on ecosystems of technology products that are decentralized, they're trustless, permissionless, and interoperable. Now it's time to explain exactly what that means. That's a lot of words that are, have been just thrown around on the internet. Like, what the heck does that mean? Decentralization and trustlessness in Web3. Rather than relying on a single centralized server like Facebook or Google, Web3 is actually built on the top of blockchain-powered crypto networks enabling our data to be stored across distributed devices worldwide. And that's also known as nodes. I'm sure you've seen that word nodes around and had no idea what it meant. Now you know. Ultimately, these distributed devices could be anything. They could be your computers or laptops or even larger servers. Communicating with each other to store, spread, and preserve the data without the need for a trusted third party. 
Now that's pretty cool. That's sweet. So thanks to these nodes, these laptops and phones and giant servers, the blockchain provides an immutable record, a decentralized proof of ownership that's unlike anything we've ever seen before. That's yeah, kind of like mind blowing. So with Web 2.0, we've had no choice but to hand our data over to these big tech giants like Google and Facebook. Like every time you go on a website, it's just like, yeah, log in with Facebook. Yeah, sure, I accept the cookies. Like, you have to do it. Even further, we've needed to trust that these parties will use our data ethically. And as we've seen with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, it's very easy for our data to be used against us. And this can have global socio-political ramifications. So problems like these are why the decentralized ownership of our data and identity, also known as self-sovereign identity, I'm sure you've heard that quite a bit, it's actually more important now than ever before. Wow, that felt pretty heavy. That felt kind of heavy. So this self-sovereign ownership is achieved through digital wallets like MetaMask or Phantom. Digital wallet is kind of like a real world wallet, except it serves as your Web3 identity containing both your currency and your data. This wallet, it's interoperable, meaning it can kind of go anywhere. It can seamlessly be taken around the internet, allowing you to choose which decentralized apps have access to your property. Quite a bit different than the current version of the internet, am I right? Additionally, all transactions and interactions on the blockchain are permissionless, meaning they don't require approval from a trusted third party to be completed. So let's dig a little bit into why this is helpful and necessary. So today, individuals like you and me use their Facebook or Google logins to access many online applications, which forces us to hand over our data. But in Web3, individuals will own their identities by replacing third parties with the blockchain. Does that make sense? Web3 unlocks this entirely new business model and value change where centralized intermediaries are no longer favored. And I feel like that's something that we have been discussing for a really, really long time. Like, we understand that the Facebooks and the Googles of the world have too much power and that there should be a better way. And us educating ourselves on this matter is the key. So ultimately, Web3 takes power from the intermediaries and gives it back to the individuals, you and me. That's what we want, right? That's why Web3 is exciting. And in fact, we're already seeing this firsthand with NFTs non-fungible tokens. Many artists and musicians and other creators have recently started experimenting with ways in which they can receive their lion's share of the revenue from their work. Much of this can actually be credited to the function of smart contracts, which are predetermined agreements programmed into the blockchain that automatically execute once these specified terms are met. We'll leave a link down below about smart contracts if you want to dive deeper into that. Smart contracts allow for secondary royalty structures, meaning creators get paid out every time their work switches hands on an open marketplace. So basically it means if I create a photo and sell it on OpenSea, which is a large NFT marketplace, and someone purchases that NFT and it's put in their MetaMask wallet, then they sell it to somebody else, I get a percentage of that sale every time it's resold. It's pretty amazing, right? But thanks to this fundamental change, creators are earning more than ever and slowly shifting from the painfully true stereotype of the starving artist. So the main takeaway of this entire video, if there is one, is this. Web3 is envisioned as the next stage of the internet. Past Web 1.0, past Web 2.0, it's gonna evolve, everything does. It's a decentralized, privacy-first internet age where users own the data, like you and me, and the profits are shifted away from these centralized intermediaries, like Google and Facebook, and into the hands of the creators, people making all the content for the internet, and their communities, the people consuming it and interacting with it. And if the developers working on the current problems are successful in building this new Web3 model, we might just get there. Hey, guys, if you, if you learned anything from this video, click the subscribe button to learn more about Web3 and NFTs. And if you prefer to read, we actually send out a weekly newsletter. Check that out in the link below. We'll see you in the next video.